1971, which some of you don't remember. Most of us. <laughs> yeah. She wasn't born there. My family and I moved from Modesto, California to Indiana. And my dad was born and raised on the same farm he lives on now. He had always lived in California. But God was calling him into the ministry, and he went to Indiana for seminary, at Grace Seminary, in Winona Lake, Indiana. And he ended up pastoring a church in the little town of Delphi, Indiana, uh, for 12 and a half years. So I grew up in Indiana, near Lafayette, Indiana, if you know where that is. Purdue University. Yeah, there you go. Everybody knows Purdue. So the, so the, most of the astronauts that went into space went through Purdue um, back in the 60s. But anyway, um, my dad quickly discovered that produce, fruits and vegetables in Indiana, was severely lacking <laughs> in freshness. And basically, you lived off canned goods, or you had a garden. And even with a garden, you didn't have oranges and peaches and things like that that were very good. In the store, the peaches were tiny and hard and didn't taste good. My wife, my wife growing up in Cleveland, um, I brought her out here one time before we moved back to California. And I said, honey, have a peach off of my brother's tree. And she goes, I don't like fresh ones. Like, what? What are you talking about? She goes, oh, they don't taste good. I said, try this one. Okay. The tree was empty in two weeks. I mean, she just kept eating and eating. She's like, these are so good. Guess what we have in our backyard now? This peach tree. Great big peach tree. So we grew up growing vegetables. I grew up with a garden, over an acre of garden. And we had everything you can imagine. And my mother having come from central Kansas uh, and part of an old order church that made their own clothes and cook, did, did everything you know, from scratch, um, was quite the canner baker cook. And uh, she, she still is. Yes, she is. Um, but I watched her do a lot of things. And one of the things she liked to make was pickles. And she had a big crock, and she would make pickles. And uh, we would grow our own cucumbers. And how many of you have had homemade pickles before that are good? Just a couple. Everybody else has only eaten store-bought. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about pickles. And we're going to ask you at the end whether you're a cucumber or a pickle. And what do you think the right answer is? Let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can be here this morning and worshiping you and looking into your word. And we ask that you would show us from your word what you would have us to have this morning. Be with me. Be with what I have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul has just finished talking about, in chapter 5, our justification. Chapter 5 of Romans. We're in Romans. We've been in Romans. Oh, yeah, I should say that. And in Romans chapter 5, he gives us this idea that our justification is permanent. We have permanently changed families. It cannot be reversed. We've gone from the family of Adam in which all sinned and have come under the wrath of God and under judgment. First five chapters. I've talked about nothing, nonstop judgment, amen? And now he says we have been put into the family of God through Jesus Christ. We have changed headships from Adam to Christ. And Adam all sinned, and in Christ all have been made alive. And this is not reversible. There are those that teach, 
and wrongly so, that if you do something bad enough, or something bad enough times, you are no longer saved. How many of you have heard that before? I didn't say you believed it. I said just, yeah, of course. The world, the world will teach you also, you know, well, I've got to have my good things outweigh my bad things. And obviously, if you have too many bad things, well, then you've got a problem, right? Under that, under that idea. That means the focus of salvation is on you. On what you do. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that salvation is by grace through faith and that that change of headship is permanent. Now, Paul stops for a minute in chapter 6. Chapter 6 is a parenthetical thought. I don't know English very well. I'll tell you what a parenthetical thought means. Or maybe Mrs. Calderon would be better at it. But a parenthetical thought is just an interruption to explain something he just said. So he's interrupting his flow of thought, saying, well, now wait a second, I need to explain this. So he just talked about, in chapter 5, verse 20, he talked about the law and grace. He says in verse 19, excuse me, verse 20 of chapter 5, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. He just made the argument in chapter 5 that everyone from Adam to Moses was guilty and under the wrath of God, but there was no law that they broke, except Adam. Adam broke God's law. God's law was, don't eat of that tree. Only one law, right? You would think, we have how many laws that we have to obey every day? On the road. Leo, how many laws do you have to be thinking about every day as you drive that big rig? And gone. But the rest of us, just driving our ordinary cars. Uh, we, we are inundated with laws. Adam had one. All he had to do was obey one rule. And he couldn't do that. Right? Everybody from Adam to Moses, chapter 5, verse 14, died. Why? Because death is a consequence of sin. What sin? Adam's sin. Therefore, Adam's sin was passed to all of us. And we are all responsible, guilty, under the wrath of God. We owe, we owe the payment of sin, and the wages of sin is death. death. We owe the payment of sin, not on our own sin, those that were from Adam to Moses especially, but on Adam's sin. That's what we call Adam's headship. Okay? We, he represented us. We were in him, etc. God gave the law to Moses, right? Ten commandments and then about 250 other things. But let's just focus on the ten. Those ten moral laws. How many of you broke this week? Don't, don't answer that, guys. Thank you. It, it's easy. We do it all the time. Jesus said it's more than just outward action. It's a thought. Don't murder means don't hate. Don't commit adultery means don't lust. Don't covet doesn't mean you go out and steal. You know, all you have to do is have that desire, that thought in, that you entertain. So the law came, according to this, to... to amplify sin. Make it bigger. Make me more guilty before God. Thanks, God. I'm now more guilty than I was before. But there's a purpose. Accountability is not only now for Adam's sin, but I'm also accountable for my own sin because now I've broken God's laws. I, even though I eat of the tree in Adam, I have sinned. I have lied. I have stolen all these things. Right? But then he goes on to say, this was done that, that the offense may abound. And where that abounded, now when God forgives sin, grace is even bigger. Grace is even greater. Isn't it fantastic that God could, could forgive somebody like Paul? 
Who's writing this? Who was a murderer? Who, who watched Stephen be stoned, complicit in the action? Who was throwing Christians into jail? You see, Paul's sin made God's grace even greater. Isn't that wonderful? But there's a, there's a, there's a logical question here. Well, if sin makes great, great grace greater, why don't I sin more? So that God's grace can be greater. What shall we say then? Verse 1. Shall we continue in sin, have a constant, repeated, habitual action of sin, so that grace may grow, abound more? This, is, this question is logical. It's normal. It's natural outworking of this doctrine that we would think, well, you know, God's grace is gr greater than all of, all of my sins, so it shouldn't really matter whether I sin more. I mean, in fact, it should be a good thing because God can forgive me more. Of course, his answer is it's unthinkable. May it never be. Certainly not. It's unthinkable that a Christian, somebody who has been given the grace of God, would ever entertain the idea that they should continue purposefully in sin so that God's grace might down. Why? Why? What is, what's the reason we shouldn't do this? And he does explain this. And here's where we get to the pickle. Okay. He says... How shall we who died to sin? This is a key, key phrase right here. Died to sin. Live any longer in it. Jesus Christ died for my sin. Amen? Amen? Did you know he also died to sin? And that we died to sin in him? What's it mean to die to sin? I, I used this illustration a while back. Uh, um, a person goes to court and is condemned to die. And he goes to the death chamber and is declared dead. And a day later comes back to life. Obviously, without God's intervention, this can't happen. But we're just going to follow the logical conclusion. He died. Did he fulfill the punishment that the court had, had given? Yes, he did. He's dead. He came back to life. Does he need, can, can the court have any more power over him? No, he died. He fulfilled the entire sentence. So when we die to sin, we die breaking its authority over us. We end its power and authority over us. This is the entire theme of this chapter. If you have your Bibles, I'm not going to put this up here, but if you have your Bibles, glance down with me. Verse 2, he said we died to sin. Verse 3, he says we're baptized into his death. Verse 4, we buried with him into death. Verse 5, united together in the likeness of his death. Verse 6, the old man was crucified, died with him. Verse 7, uh, anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Still death, right? Verse 8, we died with Christ. Verse 9, death no longer has dominion. Verse 10, he died to sin once for all. It seems like Paul wants us to understand something about death. Don't you think? That's kind of the, the theme we're talking about here in chapter 6. And so we're going we're gonna to try to explain this. First of all, <clears throat> die to sin, found here in, in verse 2. I'm going to teach you some Greek. This is in the aorist tense. I should ask Jesse what the aorist tense means, but I'm not sure he knows it. So I'll give it to you. It means a single action that has taken place and been completed in the past. This is not, an, we are not dying to sin. We will not die to sin in the future. It's not an ongoing process. It's a single action that happened in the past 
and was finished. Got it? You got the implications of it? It means this. When we died to sin, it means we end our, any relationship we have, our subordination to sin as our master. Verse 9 tells us that he cannot die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. We'll get there. It no longer is Christ's master. How on earth was death Christ's master? He submitted to it for us. How does that work? How can we have died to sin? And what does it do that frees us from the penalty? Verse 3 says, Do you not know that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Let's just stop there for a minute. You remember what J. Vernon McGee said. Somebody somebody be able to quote it for me. And, <coughs> Richie, say it nice and loud. Baptism is Baptism is identification. Baptism is identifying one thing with another. Baptism is the identification of us with Christ. There are two words in the Greek that are used for baptism. One is bap, bap, bapto, which means to dip. Excuse me. And the other is baptizo, which means to immerse, creating a change. I want to read this little uh, illustration to this, because I think it was clearer than I can put it. About these two words, we gain help from classical literature. The Greek used the word baptizo from about 400 BC uh, to about the second century after Christ. And in their literature, baptized always pointed to a change having taken place by some means. It's important. Josephus used it of the crowds that flooded into Jerusalem and wrecked the city, immersed the city and it was destroyed by baptism of people. Okay? Other examples are dying of a cloth and the drinking of too much wine. In each of these cases, there is a liquid or something like it. The crowds, of, uh, the crowds were a human wave. Dye and wine are liquids. But essentially, the idea is that of a change. Jerusalem was wrecked. The dyed cloth changes color. I don't know if you about you, but you can't ever get it back. It's permanent. Right? The drinker becomes different. He misbehaves. The body rectifies that, but that's that's the, the clearer example though. And I know this is the meaning uh, if the meaning from the Greek poet and physician Nicolander, who lived about two hundred BC. It's a recipe for making pickles. Okay, I told you pickles were going to come into this. And it's helpful because it uses both bapto, to dip, and baptizo, to immerse. It says to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water, and then baptized, baptizo, into the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern immersing a vegetable into a liquid, but the first is a temporary change, it gets hot. The second the act of baptizing the vegetable produces a permanent change and it becomes a pickle. This is, I don't know about you, but water baptism didn't change you. If you were baptized, immersed, praise God, God, we are told to do that as a symbol of something that happened inside, but this is what happened inside. We were baptized, immersed into Jesus Christ, changing you because you are now in him. Permanently changing. We were baptized into his death. Why is that important? 
because we were changed by his death to where we no longer have a relationship with death. The penalty of sin has been, has been satisfied because we were changed by his death for us and we have died to sin. He then goes on and says in verse 4, and this is fascinating. I never thought this before this study. He says, therefore, we are buried. Not we are dead, not we died, but we are buried with him through baptism. Um, just like a dead body is immersed in the earth, changing that body back to the earth when we die. And I know with caskets and bolts and everything and limb bombs and to prevent that from happening, eventually it's going to happen. So we're immersed into his death. And Boyce says this, to go back to sin once you have joined, been joined to Christ is like digging up a dead body. Because we've been buried. He goes on to talk about the old man and the new man. Something Richie touched on last week. I'm so glad he didn't take my passage. He only took Jesse's. <laughs> We're buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Not only has baptism changed us, identified with his death, identified with his burial, but has identified us also with his new life that we not have defeated death, but we've also are given life to live for God. Even so, we should walk in the newness of life. We should practice. This verb is not in the aorist tense. It's in the a present tense. It's a current action with ongoing consequences. It is something we are to continue to do. We're gonna, we should walk in the reality of the change that has been made. If you've received Jesus Christ if you, if, as your Savior, you have been baptized into his death. You have died to sin. These are irrefutable facts. Now walk like it. Now act like it. Now live like it. Walk in the newness of life that he brings because of this fact. For we have been together, been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we are also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was killed, dead, died, crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away. This body of sin starts with Adam's sin, the sin nature. The old man is that sin nature that you had since the day you were conceived in your mother's womb. You had that old man, that body of sin. And only by crucifying it with Jesus Christ through salvation can it be done away so that we are no longer slaves to sin. The idea is he's broken the dominion. How many of you have sinned this week? I, I'd like to see hands, because anybody that's not raising their hand is a liar, and that's a sin. <laughs> Put your hands up. We are no longer, no longer do we have to sin. It doesn't mean that we won't sin. It doesn't mean that we don't fail. But we no longer have to. Why? Because there's a change inside. Because now you're a pickle. Stop acting like a cucumber. Sometimes we forget we're a pickle. And we start acting like a cucumber again. And what's the Bible say? Go to the Lord. He wipes it clean. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just. Why is he just? Because Christ has already paid for that sin. That's justice. He's just and righteous to forgive us of those sins. And cleanse us. Let us start anew. 
But we no longer are slaves. Those who submit themselves to sin are slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. But now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. So the wages of sin is death. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior, doesn't apply to you anymore. Amen? We have victory. For the death that he died, he died to sin once, sin once for all. It's a one-time event. It happened in the past, eras tense. It was completed in the past. It stays in the past. But the life that he lives, future, he lives to God. And that's what we're to do. Two things. Two things to consider. Consider yourself, reckon yourself, dead to sin. It's already true, but you need to write it down in the books. You need to apply it to your life. You need to start living like it because it's true. You know, you can live like your bank account's empty. Even though you have a million dollars in it. I heard a story once of a, of a woman who was a bit of a hermit. And she, she was known to eat cat food and never had anything. She wore rags. This is a true story. And after she died, they went in to clean up her house. And it was so, so terrible, they, they had to gut it. And in the walls, they found millions of dollars. She knew it was there. She put it there. She was hoarding money. And she, had, she was one of the wealthiest, wealthiest women in the county. She didn't live like that. She didn't reckon herself wealthy. She kept in her mind herself a slave to poverty. My friends, you're wealthy in Christ. That's not what, what the spiritual life's about. Amen? Amen? And I'm not ever going to promise you that you're going to be healthy, wealthy, or wise. I hope you get wiser as we go. Amen? But God didn't promise us health or wealth. Sorry. Because we have a wealth that is far greater than anything on this earth. <coughs> We're dead to sin. And we're lying to Jesus Christ. Now, consider yourself. Apply it. Reckon it. It's an accounting term. And start understanding and living it out. Because the change that has happened is real. If you've placed faith in Jesus Christ, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, by the way, if you know him as Savior, you know him as Lord. If you know him as Lord, you know him as Savior. Amen? If you have placed faith in him, it's all done. You're already there. Because you've been baptized. You've been put in that vinegar, and the change has happened, and it happened that fast. That's what Matt actually has God applied you into baptized into Jesus Christ at that moment of faith. That moment of faith. So my question is. Are you a pickle, living like a cucumber? Are you a cucumber trying to think you're a pickle? You ever been into a cucumber thinking it was a pickle? And oh, that's nasty. Right? If you want it, a good pickle. Bread and butter's the best. Right? Amen. Are you truly a pickle? Live like it. Start acting like it. Reckon yourself. Father God, we thank you for your word. Help us, Father, to live out what has already been declared true in our lives. Help us to share with others, <laughs> as funny as it sounds, how they can become a pickle, too. Help us to live like we're dead, to sin. But let's be alive to Christ this year as we seek to serve our community for your glory and for your
Jesus' name.